Today we have our good friend Dennis McBurney from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And Dennis is a, a, a longtime friend. He used to live in the Wichita area, had a change in positions and so forth, moved to Pennsylvania and lucky them. But uh, uh, he still shows up at postcard shows all over the country. And we're just delighted to have him today. One thing you'll notice in the, uh, uh, most of you are club members and you received the November issue several days ago, and that was telling uh, a lot about a new checklist that had been uh, published by Dennis and by Morgan Williams, and all about the uh, postcards of Mr. Connard. I'm going to let him talk about that, but I mentioned the word Morgan Williams, and he's kind of associated in a great deal with uh, exaggeration postcards all over the country and has made that kind of, I don't want to say his life's work, but it's been a real focus for sure. And uh, Dennis has also been uh, one of the many Kansans who's been interested in exaggeration postcards and you know, just thinking about how we have been, uh, uh, Kansas has been associated with some of the, the best or some of the greatest, the most prolific uh, exaggerated postcard artist right here, photographic. But uh, uh, we thank uh, Morgan again. He was the first one in our speaker series, it seems years ago, but it was really just 11 months ago when he spoke at our January 2021 uh, club meeting, the first time we tried one of these uh, uh, speaker series, and it's uh, it took it uh, took off with a bang, and we've been uh, working with them ever since, and we've enjoyed it a lot. But Dennis, please uh, take the microphone, unmute yourself, and, and uh, join us and. Uh, Tell us about uh, your checklist and this whole business of checklisting. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're at and when you're actually watching this. Uh, as Hal said, Dennis McBurney, I uh, worked many, many years in the Wichita area. We raised our family, and uh, when Boeing Wichita sold, um, I didn't like the deal that was being offered, so kind of moved on. And uh, I think I'm only a few weeks away from retirement, so this could get interesting real quick. But I've been working with Hal Ottaway and other postcard uh, club members on what to collect and how to collect it since the turn of the century. Don't you just love that phrase? I collected stamps as a youth in the 60s and uh, in the 90s, I got back into stamp collecting and got interested in first day covers. Somebody invited me to the Wichita postcard club show and sale around 2000 and after looking at the postcard displays at the show and talking to several of the eaters i was hooked uh, i picked up my first rick gary postcards at that show and i eventually personally purchased an illustrated checklist of rick's postcards and starting to look for all of the ones i didn't have that part of my collection is now four large notebooks and it's far from complete and since i've helped create a few illustrated checklists, and most collectors carry some sort of checklist to a postcard show. Hal asked me to talk about my experiences with specifically illustrated postcard checklists. And, uh, you know, we, we all carry around things we call checklists, but I did a search early on in doing this presentation. I found across an Apollo 13 checklist, $388,000. Uh, any of you that were live in 1970 might remember the little problem that they had. Um, Apollo 13, the lunar module system activation checklist was not going to be used on that mission. James Lovell used it for a, a few critical calculations. Uh, I was just a teenager at that point, and I remember the newscasters at the time saying that if anyone made a mistake on calculating the re-entry angle to Earth's atmosphere, capsule would just bounce off the atmosphere and be lost in space. So yeah, those were some pretty valuable 
calculations. But uh, talking about other checklists, ones that we can associate with a little bit more readily, uh, checklists can, besides give you a list of postcards, can give some recognition to the postcard photographers, artists, and publishers. Uh, we try and capture as much additional information. Where were they at? What did they do? What years did they operate? Um, the major checklists I've been involved with over the years, we usually include some kind of biography. Usually it's fairly short. The Connard biography has grown to four pages. Uh, I think it's still a good read, but uh, they kind of help collectors and historians and actually anybody learn about their works. Um, who knows, they may end up on Wikipedia someday. We're still discussing some of those kind of things. But uh, checklists of what you have and what you want, uh, uh, unlike the Apollo 13, it won't make you thousands of dollars, but uh, may help you from buying too many duplicates. Uh, and I will confess that uh, even with a checklist, if it's not up to date, you may have duplicates or triplicates uh, coming into your collection. But uh, checklist with details about your collection, some notes on it, uh, Sometimes you've got some uh, space fillers uh, in your collection and you would like to know that if you run across a better example at a reasonable price that uh, you probably ought to buy it. And if you can't find a checklist for your collecting interest, uh, what this presentation is about is considering how to make your own. So here are some pointers. We'll, we'll cover a couple of these steps too later, but uh, Start with what you've got. You know, I've got a few um, areas that I collect that I don't know everything about them. In some cases, I don't know much of anything about them, but I do try and keep track of what I, I've got. Um, usually you can find some sort of checklist for, for a lot of the different kinds. Um, some helpful hints might be if you're creating your own to include the postcard publisher name and, and their IDs if they're known. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the exaggeration postcards are unsigned and, and even the, the printers aren't known. So, uh, but still record what you want, the titles and captions. The, some of the postcard titles, if you look at them, aren't that helpful. So maybe you uh, need to add some information if the title doesn't help you out, uh, considering noting the conditions. I mentioned that before. but. Uh, some of the postcard series we've uh, we've figured out it's helpful to look at the postal history to do a, a actual postal survey. We did that with the Hershey bar cards that I'll talk about here in a little bit. And if you're uh, thinking someday you might uh, end up with a, an illustrated checklist as you're going through your collection, you might want to consider scanning the front and back of your postcards. This is uh, one of the first checklists I ever saw for postcards. I uh, think it was around 2003 when I went to that show uh, for several years, Terry McDaniels. I didn't see Phil here, but sometimes they join us. Uh, she worked tirelessly on this thing. Uh, maintaining the index was a real hassle, adding the, the yearly updates for new releases. I know she worked with Rick. She worked with lots of collectors. Um, just. Just a fantastic checklist. I've, I still have mine, uh, although I think the last update I got was uh, probably around 2005. And uh, this Susan ought to recognize, uh, Ray Walter's World. It's uh, a really deep dive into life and times of uh, Ray Walters uh, from the late 20s and 30s on up through the, the mostly into the 50s, but it's illustrated. It's got an illustrated checklist in the back. Um, and uh, as I told a couple of people, this is probably the most expensive $40 book I've ever purchased. Uh, I've been collecting exaggeration uh, comic postcard for uh, fishing postcards for a few years when Susan Lane told me that there was a book for the Ray Walters postcards, which she recognized in my collection. Of course, she had one for sale. So in uh, 2015, I bought the book, and read it from cover to cover, and I've been collecting 
postcards from Ray Walter's world ever since. I'd never considered collecting a comic camping trailer or nudist camp postcards before I got this book, but uh, they are interesting and I, I've got a fair number of them. This is uh, uh, blown up from the checklist in the back and no, I don't write on my book. So this is a copy that I've uh, made and put into my notebook of checklists. Um, you know, I, I would note what I have found, which identifier number they had, whether I've got it filed in a certain subject area. Uh, this one I've got to postal history. Um, I noticed that I've marked these as mint. I truly believe they're, they're unused, but I doubt they're in mint condition. So these are the kind of notes that I, I personally use. Uh, there was a, a postcard that was an automobile related, may or may not have been Ray Walters. I just simply added the number and the fact that I've got one so I don't buy two or three more of those. And uh, some of you are aware of uh, Reverend Garnhart. He did lots of different checklists uh, when he was an active collector. I met him at the York postcard show and sale a few years ago. And I purchased some of these Walters postcards there and a non-illustrated checklist of Kurt Tyke comics. At that time I already had a copy of the two DVD set of listings and illustrated checklists for postcards of World War II. And this is a page out of those um, that I, I carry around. I worked for Boeing, as I mentioned, uh, for 27 years and airplanes still just kind of fascinate me. This is, uh, a web search that I had done from the Tuck uh, database on postcards. Uh, it is hosted in England. I use it as a reference whenever I'm tracking down something. This happened to be some exaggeration. Well, they, they showed up occasionally in exaggeration in the postcard dealers. So I, I had to learn some more about them. Found out there are 12 in, in this set. And there's also uh, 12 more that look just like this, but they've got green borders. So I put together my old little checklist and uh, try and track down all of them. Uh, quite often, this is an example of a historical society that uh, captured a lot of the postcards I was looking for. These happen to be from uh, A.S. Johnson. Uh, he was the second photographer in his family and he, his claim to fame was uh, a lot of exaggeration postcards. And this website is set up if, if this were live, you could click on this and get a much larger illustration. But uh, sometimes when you're starting out, you're looking for anything and everything. So keep in mind that uh, Google search is good for finding things other than how you show up on, on certain organizations. Uh, this is one of the, the I guess, self-made. One of my checklists that I do carry around, uh, it's not an exhaustive checklist, it's more of an inventory. And I use it, uh, I started collecting the 1908-1909 Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition cards, um, kind of as a supplement to the 1962 Seattle World's Fair. I've got a, a lot of first day covers and postcards from that era, but uh, I just thought they were nice supplemental. Uh, I think this is the only uh, checklist I've got where I put the price on it. Um, and I don't even know why I did that, but I did. But if you've gone through everything and you've figured out, well, yeah, there's a lot of information out there, but there's still not exactly what I'm looking for. And you decide to, uh, to maybe look at creating an illustrated checklist, just be aware it's gonna probably be a group effort. Um, you can start out by inventory your collection, uh, look at the auction sites, historical society, websites, anything and everything. Find out what there's out is available. Uh, you're probably going to run across some collectors or dealers that may lead you to other collectors and dealers and talk to everybody, pool your resources if everyone's willing. Um, you may occasionally run across something, somebody that doesn't wanna share information. I'm sure nobody in this group falls in that, but uh, it happens occasionally. Recommend you go ahead and consolidate the title list, group whatever makes sense, and decide the scope. Uh, some of these 
photographers were very prolific at creating town views. And if you want to know about every postcard that was released by Conard in uh, Garden City, great. Uh, that wasn't a big part of a catalyst behind the Conard checklist. I did include a lot of historical images, but it's not. But that part of the checklist is not exhaustive. And then you get in just kind of the grunt work, you know, scan the, the postcards, get the po picture side, the address side, or front and back if you prefer, uh, document the postcard collection. And, and I've done fairly well at keeping track. Where did the image come from? Who's the owner of the postcard? And if you decide what format. Um, the last couple we've done is standalone booklets, and that's what we did this one. Uh, in today's age, still don't know if that's the best way to go, but that's what we decided to do. Um, then you just simply go through and you start creating the layouts. Um, hopefully you add some information about the designer that you've learned as you've gone along and then you publish and share. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? Here's an example of a fairly simple one-page checklist. Uh, those of you in the Wichita area probably recognize the uh, Sunflower postcards. Um, I had two other cohorts in this creation, uh, Andrea Turley. Uh, she's passed away several years ago and Zoe Marie just recently passed away. But we all figured out at one of the Wichita postcard clubs that we were all trying to collect the same things. Andrea had a fairly complete list, but even hers wasn't totally uh, complete. So we compared notes and uh, did make a, a checklist that I used for a couple years. And eventually, I think after I found all of the postcards on her list, I, I scanned mine and put together a illustrated checklist. Let's see, Hal, as I was telling Hal and Alan earlier, you, I need a magnifying glass to use this checklist. Uh, the, the illustration is about the size of a postage stamp, and any of you have used uh, Scott's catalog or something like that, a good stamp collector always has his uh, magnifying glass. Hal gave a presentation about these postcards in February 2016, and the checklist was reprinted in the Wichita Postcard Club newsletter for that month. And it's one of two single page postcard checklists I've created. This is the other one. Uh, when I moved out of the Douglas, Kansas, Wichita, Kansas area and moved to the Hershey area, I actually was in Hershey for a year. And uh, on weekends, since it was just me, I did a lot of visiting of uh, antique shops in the area and started running across a couple of things. These little painterly ones, uh, similar style to what uh, Tuck called oilettes, uh, but they're also similar in style to the uh, Wichita Sunflower Club or sunflower postcards that I talked about earlier. And so I, I started picking those up and we figured out there were originally 16 of these postcards. This little one here, the tea house became the 17th years after the original group had been published, but uh, did include that. The other project when I was back here was um, working on these Hershey bar cards. Most of you may have seen these that are they're slightly smaller in width than the uh, normal postcards of the time, early 1900s. And they were supposedly sized to fit inside the wrapper of a Hershey chocolate bar. And instead of the cardboard, they put in the, uh, the postcards. Most of the series that happened to, the very last series never made it into a chocolate bars, uh, World War II kind of interrupted uh, Hershey's efforts got redirected to uh, chocolate bars for the soldiers and they didn't need any of these postcards. But uh, Neil Foshnot is uh, kind of the go-to guy for Hershey, all things collectible. Uh, I heard Don Brown mentioned earlier, he was uh, a key part of trying to track down some of these series and Jim Ward. And uh, we documented a lot of different uh, images. Um, and the book was published by the Hershey Dairy Township Historical Society. It's an odd size, and I, I personally don't carry that. I've got a, a, another version of it that I carry in my checklist uh, notebook because it's easier for me. But uh, 
it filled a need for the historical society because people like me would go in there and say, what about these cards? They had some, they knew a little bit about it, but between Neil and Don and Jim, we uh, kind of fleshed out the story and uh, it, it was a nice project. The project, the latest one I wanna talk about today is uh, Pop Connard. I, I didn't find anything written that ever called him Pop, but that's what nickname was attributed to him. Frank uh, Connard was an entrepreneur uh, in, which, in the Garden City, Kansas area. But uh, after we had put together the, the Dad Martin checklist for those postcards from around the uh, Ottawa area, uh, another area that fascinated me was the exaggeration postcards from Connard. He, he was about a generation later than Martin. He was primarily in the 30s and 40s for a lot of his postcards. But um, a former member, Frank Wood and Larry Romick and uh, Morgan had put together the first checklist that I saw around 2005. And then later on, uh, Bert Phillips sent me his list and uh, I contact con the Finney County Historical Museum. And they also had a listing of a lot of the cards but uh, looking back, it's amazing how many they didn't know about. And I'd scanned all of my cards and I met with Morgan when we were both on the East Coast uh, most of the time around 2012. And then things happened, uh, didn't get anything more done. But uh, with the uh, advent of COVID-19, I had a little more time on my hands. And so continued to uh, communicate with Bird and Hal and Patrick Clement and Morgan and uh, they sent me some more images for some items we were um, having trouble, I was having trouble track down. Um, and then I continued to work with Morgan to organize the images. Uh, we kind of did them by topics and there are, are several that are numbered. Uh, the numbers don't always make sense. We don't always know why there are gaps in some of the numbers, but uh, I finally did the page layouts for the printed booklet this year. And with uh, Patrick Clement's help, we included that four page biography I was talking about earlier. And uh, yes, a limited edition of the book that's been published, they uh, are available and uh, we will show them. This is kind of the layout of the front cover. This is some earlier uh, layouts that when I put this presentation together originally for October, that didn't quite work out. So here we are in November. So again, a lot of the similar type uh, layouts we had done, this is some of the early examples from the photography studio. They aren't exaggeration, but uh, Pop Conard was known for his dust storms, uh, 1934, 35 timeframe. And then uh, since dust storms weren't bad enough, uh, there was an invasion of the grasshoppers uh, about the same time ate all the crops, devastated uh, all the local ranchers and farmers. But uh, Pop kind of tried to make uh, light of it as best he could. Uh, this is uh, Grasshopper being interviewed by the local radio uh, announcer. And uh, some women on the jackrabbits are going to the fair. And it, it was an interesting series. There are a lot of these that... Uh, I have never seen for sale. I, I've handled once uh, in some cases where I scanned the original and some cases I've never handled them because I just got an image sent to me from uh, Chicago, from Bird or somebody. But uh, we also included some things. There's, there was a trip that Connard and, and several of his staff went to the World, World Wonder Tower in Genoa or near Genoa, Colorado. And those postcards are rarely seen, but we did include a section of it, um, somewhat to hope that more of them come out, but to also to give credit for a project that, uh, especially during the depression years, they, they didn't always work out. This is, we're coming to the end, hold on here. Uh, this is more of the Wichita postcard. And yes, I put it as two words because at least in the first two, that's how the back of the postcard says. Two words. But um, the first one was uh, John Dedrick. Um, 
If you missed it, Hal just did a presentation for the uh, Western New York Club on, on this and uh, showed several pages out of the checklist. I mentioned the Dad Martin. That was probably the biggest project I'd done at the time. Um, it's probably ripe for a second edition. I don't know if that'll happen or not. Uh, Damon Birchbark postcards. Uh, there's a two-page version and three-page version of this we put together. I think one of them had been published in an early version of the uh, Wichita Postcard newsletter. For those of you who like to surf the web, there's lots of places you can look. Uh, I believe Alan will be putting these in the links in the, after the YouTube video is presented. Uh, Western New York Postcard Club, I mentioned. Uh, Wichita, of course, this is how you may, many will be seeing this. Metropolitan, uh, Susan's uh, near and dear, but uh, I use it as a reference uh, just to learn about some of the different postcard publishers, some of the ways to, to date and, and look at the history. It's really good. Uh, the Art and Humor, this is a, another website that Morgan had worked with uh, to get kind of a good representation. I think they did a better job for uh, Stanley Johnson Jr., uh, his exaggeration postcards. I think it's better than the, the Historical Society's version. Um, University of Maryland Special Collection. This is where um, Don Brown's collection is at, I believe. And then Kurt Tyke is, has been rehosted over to Newberry uh, Library. And I added the catalog because as we get more and more away from paper, um, the app is a, an option to, to catalog and track your own uh, collections. The hub portion of it is way different societies and uh, various historical groups and museums are, are publishing what they have on their site. Uh, it's been a tremendous tool for a lot of groups. And then this, I mentioned uh, grading and pricing. I'm not going to try and read this to you, but basically this is one way to kind of denote the different conditions uh, in your collection if you decide to go down that route. So Mint is, as I noticed uh, on, on my notation, Mint, a perfect card just as it comes from the printing press. Well. I know I don't have too many of those, um, but I do have some excellent and some very good condition cards. Uh, no obvious defects or, or just some minor ones. And I believe this is a time for questions and answers. Oh, thank you, Dennis. My goodness. Um, Bill Burton, do we have any questions? Wondering uh, if we can uh, ask, try to stump the star here. <laughs> well, we don't have any direct comments, uh, but we do have a fanboy um, from Frank F., uh, who said earlier on, um, I recognize these postcards. I have a few. <laughs> um, is, I think that's probably all of us could say that. But um, do you find that you, you prefer carrying around your printed uh, checklists, or have you tried putting them on a, a laptop or something even smaller, say an iPad or uh, 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 something like that? I have experimented out with, uh, I, I, one of my pre-retirement gifts to myself was a iPad Pro Max. So it's, it's the large format one. And so I can go ahead and, and uh, put a PDF on that and it, it's almost the same size as a, an eight and a half by 11 page. And so I'm, I'm looking at converting to that. I can write on the PDFs, I can do the annotation on it. Um, but, you know, from the various sources I have and, and some of the updates that I've done as I file collections, which I've got a stack I need to, to file someday, um, I'm still using my paper. So, you know, for me, I'll, I'll have a, I won't actually carry the entire Connor checklist. I, I prefer the three punch, three hole punch version and I'll select the pages I'm collecting. I, I've got most of the dust cards, but there are some rare ones that uh, if I ever run across them and, 
you know, it doesn't break the bank, I'll pick those up. So I wanna make sure I've got that checklist. And likewise, there are a lot of the exaggeration postcards that um, I've personally never seen for sale. And if I run across them, I, I'll pick them up. Um, the Martin checklist, I've got a fair number of the Martin checklist, but every once in a while you, you'll you run across um, uh, a rare variation. There was some advertising uh, cards, I think the ringer or washer, um, and it was fairly common to see that with the uh, exaggeration apples. But until two years ago, I'd never seen it in uh, the cabbage, uh, other than the, the illustration we put in the checklist. So I picked that up, I double checked my, my checklist and lo and behold, no, I didn't have it. So I, I bought it. It wasn't terribly expensive, so it was nice. Mm -hmm. One of the things I found with my checklist is that I wound up with a large tote bag and it was like lifting weights. <laughs> so I, I ran in the first time I met Bill. Oh yeah. Well, that's nothing, Just, but I'm talking about a tote bag. Like they made LL bean tote bags. Out. Yeah. <laughs> first time I met Bill Martin, um, I plunked this thing down in his, uh, in his stand at, uh, at Brimfield. And he said, what's that? I said, well, there's my checklist. I'm making sure I don't buy any duplicates. And there was a guy next to him who rolled his eyes and said, what about using a computer? I said, well, I, I can't afford a laptop computer. He said, don't, don't do that. Um, get a used laptop, which I wound up buying for $15, <laughs> and put it up on a website. Well, all of a sudden, it turns out that if you can find somebody who will design a quick and dirty website for you, including the ability to, to put your scan images uh, on it, you can do this relatively cheaply. And the great beauty of this is that a JPEG, if you put it as a thumbnail, it's one side. You can blow it up darn near any size you want if you use a 300 DPI scan. And this changes everything. Yeah. And one of the last slides I had was about catalog it. And that was actually the impetus for the original designer. He collected, seems odd to me, but various baskets. Maybe this is more up Hal's uh, area, various Indian baskets of different weavings, of different colors, of different styles. And so he worked with some of his technical friends and they created uh, the first round of the website. What I've run into, at least here in South Central Kansas, is there are a couple of postcard shows, one of them especially in Lancaster, where I don't have internet access at that particular facility. So in my case, what I'm looking at is, all, because the iPad I've got is, has got a lot of memory, my ultimate goal is to go ahead and, and take and get PDFs of, of everything I collect um, which most of my printed pages came from PDFs and I can go ahead and put them in there and I can put annotation on it. So at some point, my uh, big notebook will probably come down to, you know, the, the thickness of an iPad and about the size of a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So it, it takes work either way. Uh, I never got to the point where I had a, a airplane pilot satchel full, but uh, I, I could see how you could go there fairly easily. Yeah, my left arm was much stronger than my right. <laughs> you didn't switch it halfway through the show? Oh, you, uh, it, it's, it's tough enough remembering that you have the darn thing with you, let alone switching hands. So no, I never did that. <laughs> okay, very good. I think Clarissa had her hand up. Um, correct, but actually some of the questions I was wondering because I was going around with a binder like this, and it was yeah. not, it's not very conducive when you're standing on a stand and trying to look through it. So I was wondering if you had another system, but you show that you don't. You have the same <laughs> big the same binder. Way. Yes. Yeah, and, and postcard dealers hate when I bring out the notebook, because I, I will go through and I'll I'll pick up anything of interest out of the particular category I'm looking at, kind of lay them out, and then I'll bring out the book. Yep. And I'll put probably a third to a half of the cards back in because I've already got it, or the one I've got's in better condition than the one that they offer. 
Uh, for the Hershey bar postcards, I actually kind of have a game where I'm, I'm looking for the earliest documented use. For those of you who do stamps, you'll, you'll recognize that from the postal history. Uh, and so I try and find postally used versions earlier than the ones I've got or Neil Foshnoss has. So uh, I've got my personal checklist that I update on that periodically and I send him updates. Yeah, hi, this is David Freund. I'm uh, asking, I had to come in late. Some other engagements kept me away. And so I missed the early part. And did you talk about how to get these uh, checklists that are now available for interested collectors? Uh, there's a combination. Uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of dump on Hal a little bit because most people have have his email or or my email is uh, very simple. It's D McBurney at iCloud.com. Uh, anybody can email me. Um, I, I've, I've been using that for a while. The, the checklist, the, the Connor checklist, um, we've produced it in two ways. One for people like me that uh, will probably just take selected pages and put it in their three ring binder. And then we've done a coil version. So in round numbers, it's, it's $20 for the three ring and 25 for the, the one with the spiral bound. At least that's our current price. We're still getting these printed on demand. Um, and I need to send several out to people that helped us along the way and some of the historical societies. Uh, how many pages are in that? It's uh, 56 pages plus, well, this is it. Uh, oh, okay. it's, it's 56 pages. This is a spiral bound version. We've got a uh, front cover. Inside is a table of contents. We've got the the four pages of, of biography, and then we get into the checklist pages. We get into dust storms and then on into the, I'm not sure how much of this you're seeing. Yeah. And, and we've got some variations and salesman samples and some of the things. So that originally we thought I'd do this in October and would be able to go to the Wichita show, but uh, things happened. My wife had her 50th uh, high school reunion the weekend of the last, uh, talk so uh she kind of got priority sorry <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, not a true it, collector i can see that <laughs> uh, well I, i'm too much of a collector for for her taste so she yeah. she will go with me to some shows but uh, she doesn't wander around too much on the sales floor uh what did you say the price on the uh connor did, uh, right now or? what we can cover the cost of uh of printing at about $20 for the three hole punch version. And they, they charge us almost five bucks to put the little holes in the spiral in the other version. Hmm. So that that's where we're at right now. And then whatever so shipping what, and is handling it, what is, is it, 30 bucks? Are probably by the time you get shipping to most places. So you're gonna yeah. be close to that. And Dennis, the book will be available at York? Uh, if you and I get the details worked out. <laughs> I like I said I've got to work with Morgan. Any of you have worked with Morgan, his projects are never done. You know, you, you just finally have to say we're going to publish. Well, we got to publish on the first 20 some copies of this. And he said, Oh, by the way, I want to go ahead and put a better biography in the, the back cover. So I actually was working on that today. So uh, before we do the next printing, I expect we'll have a slight revision to the back inside cover, but uh, it we'll, we'll have something for you, Susan. <laughs> I, I'm not so sure I'm going to sit down and autograph any. Maybe we'll do like the Max did. I'll, I'll pre-autograph some things close to my name because I'm, I'm still working. I, I've still got until... Well, I think it's going to be December 23rd this year, and then I, I will be retiring from a database designing and database administration. And apparently a full-time uh, postcard collector and uh, stained glass artist. Uh, a friend of mine, maybe, maybe you're aware of this, but a friend of mine has a, you know, a printing press, a, a digital printing press, and he can... I would say a book like that he could do in about a minute and uh, and then make a 
two folds in the middle to make a spine and put a staple in it. So in, in, in a minute, minute and a half, you have a staple uh, with a real spine, not just a, not just a signature fold yeah uh a book and I, I don't know what he charges for that but he's done a couple things like that for me and it's a miracle to watch it i don't know if that uh is something you're familiar with or we're, we're open for suggestions on that because uh last time we did a checklist uh i kind of handed it back over to the club they took care of the printing worked with i'm not sure who it was at the time office depot or one of the other small printing right now in carlisle i'm working with staples they've got a fairly efficient uh not the cheapest in the world but it's cheaper it, it's about the same price of me printing at home just the cost of the toner if you notice there are a lot of pages that are just almost black with uh the images from the postcard so it uh, for 10 copies i went through uh the large capacity uh toner for, mm. for my brother printer so i did wow. that once it took me all day and it was uh, approximately the same cost of sending it in electronically to Staples. So, yeah, we're we're still experimenting and trying to learn how to how to do that best. There there are a couple of websites that uh, will do print on demand. They'll take care of the selling and the mailing. Uh, still would be interested in that, but for right now, it's falling on my shoulders to get the copies out. Uh, Morgan's brother, I believe plans to offer them on eBay at some point, but uh, we have to finalize the, the last inside page and uh, then get copies printed and out to him. Wow. One question just come up. Does uh, the prices that you've been quoting include shipping and handling? No, because it, it varies so much as to where we're going and, and how you prioritize it. Uh, and book rate, I think not even getting delivered these days, so. No, that that pretty much covers just the the cost of of publishing and and uh, a little bit for advertising that uh, Morgan wants to do. I, I really didn't mean this to turn into a sales pitch for the latest checklist, but uh, we'll field any any questions we've got on. Somebody um, puts in all the time that you put into doing these checklists uh, is doing a service of the whole hobby. So take your time. And pitch away <laughs> all right yeah well i appreciate that but uh if i was in it for the money i i would <laughs> be very poor so it just like when i worked for boeing my boeing uh salary supplemented the the effort that i put into the martin and uh so far my contracting uh budget has uh has supplemented all of our efforts on the printing of the the Connor checklist. But you're going to be retired now. Uh, yeah, and from what I hear from all the retirees, that means I'll never have time to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Uh, are you going to uh, post the websites that he had listed there in our uh, journal so that we can uh, look at those? I think if you look at your uh, uh, I believe Alan's going to add them to the, uh, uh, what do we the say, YouTube. when we record this, when we make a unit and it's on YouTube and it will be there, I believe. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the plan. I, I, I copied down those uh, addresses as quickly as I could, but I realized I could have taken my camera and taken a picture of the um, of the screen and I would have had it. Uh, on that note, you talked about um, catalog it that app mm -hmm. is that's an app that we apply, we can apply and it gives us what? Okay, in in my account, uh, it's free for up to like 150 postings, which is sufficient for me mm -hmm. to prove it, if it'll work or not. And then they start charging for individuals with more postings and uh, museums, I think it's like 400 a year. I think if the Wichita Postcard Club decided, hey, we're just gonna go all out, we're gonna publish this out there and, and we could post a checklist there, then you're looking at four to 500 a year. But for a museum, that's still a pretty cheap option compared to some of the other uh, 
but the catalog it uh, intrigues me because you can not only post your images, but you can post information about the, the postcard, the photographers, uh, the companies, uh, if you've got any information about the locale, uh, if you want to put some information about the subject, um, you know, maybe somebody wants to know about City Hall in downtown Wichita because it's on a, a Sunflower Postcard Club. It's uh, last time I was there, it was home of one of the historical societies uh, across <laughs> from the downtown uh, uh, library. So, you know, I, I have not found a limitation on it yet. Um, the hub portion is, is where you choose to publish. The, the app itself, the catalog at dot app, which is a website, which is somewhat misleading. Um, that's yours, that's private. Uh, you choose what you publish, if anything. Mm -hmm. So far, I haven't published anything because I haven't spent a lot of time on it. Sort of had some other projects going on recently. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's an area, that's one of the areas Morgan and I talked about maybe publishing a large part of his collection putting it out there so it can be researched. And, and so it's in one spot for all the different photographers. All, because in his collection, it's not just postcards. He also has a lot of uh, cabinet cards, uh, the stereo view cards. He's, when he collects something, he goes all in. Uh, <laughs> you know. yeah. One of my questions, when I do try to catalog, uh, topics that I have, I use a spreadsheet and mm -hmm. I don't find that I can get enough in on one line so that I can see it. Uh, is, are there ways around that? Well, that's when you're looking at an app or a database. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've designed web pages that contain all of that, but uh, quite honestly, the catalog it, especially for just try out for free, uh, it has all the features that I designed in into every app that I've looked at or, or worked with. So okay. uh, lot, lots of choices out there. Uh, lowest common denominator is that printed page. Well, one thing that occurs to me, and that is uh, that as, the, as important as this is for collectors, uh, and, but it is also important for, in effect, the history of photography. In other words, American studies, women's studies, cultural studies, uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, academic programs to have this resource of photographs. They're not available in any other form but photo postcards. Yeah. If that were, if somehow you could form a partnership with the Beinecke or something at Yale or, 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 or maybe, you know, Duke or something like that, you know, that that people could contribute to this and you could have sort of a virtual library that would be accessible to collectors and to scholars and to artists. I think the, the resource for me, the, 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 the depth of the knowledge of collectors and the commitment the collectors have to the, to the photo postcard are, are such that, you know, it, it doesn't exist in any other form and it won't exist as we, uh, like myself, <laughs> are nearing the croak phase of our endurance. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I think it'd be great, absolutely and important for cultural and artistic and photographic history to envision this as a larger project. Yeah. And, and I've talked to, with, uh, participated in some webinars <coughs> with uh, museums and what they're finding once they use an app, they happen to be using Catalog It as they start putting more and more of their acquisitions online, their research numbers are, are going up because people seem to be more inclined to be, go to the website rather than write a long letter. I know how you're a fan of letters, but not everybody likes to write letters. Um, but, you know, just asking for something from a historical museum takes a little effort going on their website, starting to do some quick search. One thing I like about catalog, it is you can search for a term and whether it's in the description, whether it's in the title, whether it happens to be in the write-up for the photographer, whether it's part of the location, it will come up with a hit. So, so it's yeah, keyworded. It is keyworded across apparently all of the text fields. Um, 
It's not the fastest website I've ever worked on, uh, but it is one of the most thorough uh, from the features that I've looked at. Uh, but, by the uh, way, I just happened to be able, to, I'm not always able to put my hands on things, but I do have uh, a copy of one of the things that I asked my printer friend okay. to uh, print this for me. And you can see it has a, a spine. Okay. That'll and and the, yeah. the reproduction whoops, is really good. And it, it takes look good. minutes. All, all he has to do is get a file. And I, I mean, I could talk to him because he does a lot of work for me for free because we're friends. But at the same time, uh, I haven't seen anything come out this good this fast. Uh, but I'd be happy to uh, ask him what it would what he okay. would charge if somebody sends a file to do a book 20 30 pages long i mean and they could be done like in a heartbeat and sent back in a two heartbeats and uh <laughs> you know it might be, it might be and and you're saying that the the research institutes the libraries get a lot of uh traffic on their websites when they post a lot of stuff yep. it occurs to me if they had a, a physical library of all these checklists of whatever number let's just throw out a number 100 checklists so a scholar could come, a collector could come, an artist could come to the institution and actually handle books and flip through them, which, you know, the website isn't always as user friendly for the applications that a person might want to uh, use. And uh, I, I think it'd be great to talk to institutions. Would you consider making physical hard copies that people could look through and if those were available in different places, different museums, uh, different uh, libraries, it could be a huge help. Yeah, I don't know if Hal or if anybody has talked to the Wichita Public Library about adding any of our publications to that, or if we need to do some kind of consolidated volume. Uh, <laughs> That, that sends me off on a tangent. I, uh, <laughs> okay. Maybe we don't need to talk about that right now. Um, I bet you there are responsible people who would see this as something more than a, than a cash making opportunity. <laughs> yeah. There is a library, Maryland Library, I think, is collecting a special collection and I don't know if also a book right. about postcards. Yeah, that's that's, that's where Don Brown's collection went to. Correct. And Correct. I've followed up a couple times. Their website is still being built. I mean, it's going to be under construction for years because there were several truckloads of postcards mm -hmm. uh, from his place in Myerstown that went south. Mm -hmm. um, I I think it actually is going to be larger than the Kurt Tite collection when it's all done. But uh, I. I know he had a lot of reference books. Uh, when you guys see him next weekend, you might ask him if his reference material went down to Maryland as well. It'd be interesting to know. The thing about the Maryland- I don't think it did. Okay. The thing about the Maryland uh, collections is that they have one curator to do everything. Mm. And it's, it's very difficult. And he also does some other things. They, for example, have the entire, AF of L CIO historical records going back to the, the time when the AF of L expanded into, into uh, industrial wide unions. It's an enormous collection. Uh, it has its own building. Oh, wow. So, you know, it, it's, it's tough. If you want to volunteer on something, it's not that far away. <laughs> Maryland. Go down there for a couple of days a week. Mm -hmm, I could, right, <laughs> right after I clear that with my wife. Speaking of Brown's, Andy Brown's collection is with the Getty. And is the Getty doing anything? Because I every time I look, I try to find stuff. I can't find stuff. And I think, you know, it's, it's like the library selling off the donated material, which is creates the worst possible anger and animosity. But if you... Uh, if you had a, something like the Getty and they've got the cash, they've got the uh, curators, they've got the staff that, that, who would actually try to do something with the collections as opposed to say what they did or have not done with Andy Brown. It would be, uh, I, I just, 
for me, I just see so many opportunities for conversations. And it seems like a lot of people that I'm meeting for the first time online here have a lot of these contacts. I just think, I think the, the possibilities, you know, if, if they're, you know, like this big, or maybe this far at this point, I, I you know, just throwing that out. David, you have to know what you're, what, what to ask for at the Getty. They, they, uh, they have uh, Andy's uh, cards and boxes and they're not scanned. So you have to ask them and tell them exactly what you're looking for. And then they will send you a scan of those cards. Hmm. Uh, that's, that's sort of good, isn't it? It'd be nice <laughs> if you could, if well, you didn't know, I mean, it's so hard to know what you want of his collection, right. which you haven't seen. Uh, <laughs> good luck with that one. A, a, a little sidebar is kind of fun. I, I was trying to look at scrapbooks in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and they said, well, look in the card catalog and exactly the same thing happened. And then they would bring out a card of 10 or 15 books and I'd glance at them and I'd say, okay, take all these back. I'm gonna look at this one. And I did this about 10 times. And then they finally said, you know what? Why don't you just come, come by sometime before the museum opens and we'll give you a little room and you can just go in the stacks and look for what you want, which is the dream. Right. Uh, but that's not gonna happen with very many institutions. You can do that with the Burdick collection at the Met. Have you really? Wow! Yeah, if yeah. if you wanted to see the, um, he has uh, five hundred albums that he uh, pasted. Catalog, he pasted himself, and uh, you can go and make an appointment in the drawing and print department, and they'll come out, bring the albums, and they lay these little velvet bricks down, and they open the albums, and you can look. Uh, at all that you want to look at. Hmm. Interesting, interesting, yeah. Yeah, um, I posted a question, uh, not a question, a statement, but apparently it's going to Alan Peterson. Hi, Alan. Um, the MFA in Boston has the Lauder collection and that's available online and in person. They've been very helpful. And not only do they store it and make a promise that it will be held and, and valued, but they've put out, I think, four books so far, and then there's another book coming out in the spring based upon the material, the postcard material that they have. So uh, the MFA might be on your list, uh, uh, Dennis. A footnote, put, a footnote to the collection. Susan, can you put the website on the chat? Okay, I'll try. Yeah, and, and somebody had asked for my email address. I put that in there uh, for those of you that aren't monitoring chat, uh, Alan put the uh, hyperlinks that uh, will be posted on YouTube. They're currently in the chat area, so you can click away uh, quickly. And does anybody know about Colnet? I don't. Oh, there they are. Uh, coin, coin. I, I'll, I'll make a quick comment about that. I, uh, it's Colnet um, collecting and connecting um, okay. it's a site that, uh, is user generated. Like I said, in the chat, you can, uh, the postcard area is pretty raw right now. Um, but it could, it's a good place to upload images, uh, and any sort of information, photographer, publisher, um, format, uh, or, uh, material. Uh, so, you know, you could have paper versus celluloid yeah. versus as far as the postcard goes. Um, there's a lot of potential there um, and it's free and unlimited. Um, mm. so I have my coin and stamp collection. Um, well, stamps are a lot more easy to catalog than postcards. Postcards are unique, a, a lot of them. Um, and stamps obviously have catalogs that everyone uses the same catalog number. Um, so, um, that would be a way to host something, um, outside of the, the, uh, catalog at app, um, because that would be unlimited. Um, okay. you need a scanner to, to, to get the images generated, but you could upload them and they host it for free. Um, 
So that would be something used. I also had a comment about museums and universities in general. I've been on museum boards and um, I wonder if any of the, the local uh, Wichita collectors have checked um, at the, any of the universities in Kansas. They also have a special collections area, whether or not there are postcards in it is another matter. Um, but uh, if you approach museums and universities with the right with the right questions and the right attitudes, they, they love to help people. Um, but as someone mentioned earlier, scanning uh, is very time consuming and um, budgets are limited and personnel are limited and time is limited of, from everybody. So it's a challenge to get up there. The MFA doesn't have the, I don't believe Susan, the, the, all of the louder collection is online. All um, of it hasn't been donated. Well, yes, but um, I'm not sure that all of the cards that they have have actually been scanned yet and are available online. Um, so uh, it can be, a, it's, it's fun to search special collections at university websites. Um, but just because you don't see it online doesn't mean that the, it's not in their collection, I guess mm -hmm. would be my point, so. And if you make an appointment through Ben Weiss, with uh, a story about your postcard connection, I'm sure you'll be welcomed. By the way, Ben Weiss tells me that in March, I think they're going to have a show of Lauder's collection, but not just the thematic ones, which have informed the earlier books, but a broader survey of American photo postcards that I think should be an absolute blockbuster show. <laughs> yes. Very good. Well, this generated a whole lot more discussion than I anticipated. Uh, good topic. Uh, I don't know, Alan and, and Hal, if you want to wrap this up or if it's coming to a natural end. Well, it is uh, three o'clock, so we've been at this, but thank you very, very much, Dennis. This has been uh, enlightening, and I was pleased with this kind of interchange and ideas and and, uh, you know, we've had probably uh, as many or more people here today with us than we've had in previous discussions. And I think it's possibly because of Dennis McBurney, people know you and know that this uh, would be a, a fine presentation and certainly it was. And we just thank you very much for it. Thanks to Bill Burton also for his help with the questions. And please know that uh, this presentation was recorded and is being, uh, will be edited and then on Facebook and YouTube in just a few days, probably. Uh, we thank you again. Uh, think about December 4 for the next club meeting, 1.45 p.m. Central Time on a Saturday. And this will be Terry Watt talking about Disney postcards. Uh, there'll be the, uh, the link to this next meeting in your December issue of the Wichita Postcard uh, Club News newsletter that Phil McDaniels does. And thanks to him and to Hugh Cox and all of the people that add to that uh, meet of the uh, newsletter every month and for everything. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This has been a, a lot of fun, and uh, we appreciate the enthusiasm and the interest in postcard collecting. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Thanks so much. Thank you.